Welcome to the BBC Morning Dawn Study Group from Padma Samiling, Venerable Kempa Rinpoche's Monastery and Retreat Center in New York. And today we're discussing their book, The Buddhist Path. Uh, we're doing specifically looking at chapter 20 called A Device on Visualization. So we'll begin with our usual opening prayers and then we'll begin the discussion today. Thank you. which is the essential, extraordinary view and doctrine of the early translation school. You keep alive and spread by the light of wisdom. Lord of Dharma, great Kempo, I pray at your lotus feet. In the palace of the old men, Dharmadhatu, the essence of all the Buddhas of the three times, the one who shows clearly the Dharmakaya of my own mind, we pray to the honorable Rukuru, glorious Rukuru teacher, precious one, dwelling on the lotus seat on the crown of my head. Hold me with your great kindness and bestow the accomplishments of body, speech, and mind. So chapter 20 begins on page 97, Advice on Visualization. And I'll give a quick summary of just the first couple paragraphs of the chapter. Uh, the Venerable Kimba Rinpoche's begin by saying that for many people it is difficult to maintain the visualization in creation stage Vajrayana practice. Uh, meditation deities are displays of primordial wisdom, our own natural awareness. They are not solid or fixed in any way, since your primordial mind is not solid or fixed in any way. Just keep practicing according to the instructions and gradually your visualization will become clearer. The famous Tirtan Minyar Dorje gave advice on visualization practice, saying that Guru Padmasambhava did not always look the way the paintings and statues depicted him. He can appear in any way that is helpful to others, so we should not only expect him to appear or behave in only one way, according to our limited conceptions. There's a famous story about Guru Mache's unrestricted, unrestricted appearance and activities that involves the great Chirtan Ratna Lingpa. Andrew will briefly summarize this story and then we'll discuss the first topic point. So, in this chapter, Rinpoche has explained that Ratna Lingpa was a famous Chirtan who lived in the 15th century, born amidst many different signs and special indications that he was a special child. Um, he grew up, got married, and lived as a householder. Um, one day in Tibet, uh, as was common at the time in the village, Ratna Rinpa and many other people were in, having a party where they did uh, archery, singing, dancing, um, drinking the Tibetan beer, Chang. Um, so they had a great time. The party went on into the night. Um, Ratna Rinpa, the next day, took his animals out to pasture. And at that time, he had obtained a text, a special biography of, Nyang, of Guru Padmasambhava by Nyang Ramima Ozer, um, which he was copying the text because he wanted to use part of the special prayer from that text in his daily practice. So he was, uh, he was really tired from all the partying the day before. He fell asleep. And when he woke up, um, he felt really fresh and joyful. And there was an old man standing in front of him who had yellow cotton robes on. So he said, how could this man be here? It's almost like he appeared from nowhere. So 
But the man reached out, he picked up that text that Radha Lankpa had been reading and, and said that, um, oh, this is a biography of Guru Padmasambhava by the great Nyam. Um, do you have special feeling of devotion towards Guru Padmasambhava? And um, Radha Lankpa said, all my, all my life I felt a special connection to Guru Padmasambhava and had all kinds of devotion. So that's why I'm copying this. I want to put that in my daily practice. So, so this old man said, oh, that's wonderful. You're, you're good. This text is really good, and you, you're quite good, too. So he said, do you know where this mountain is around here, the hovering mountain of the Garuda? And Radha Lengpa said, I don't know that one, but there's this Garuda mountain. And, and the old man in the yellow cotton robe said, oh, that's the one. You know? So then he pulled out a, 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 a special scroll, like a roll of paper from his chuba, and he, he gave that to Radha Lengpa, and he said, open this. And uh, Ratna Lingpa read that, and, and it described Ratna Lingpa by name, including, you know, um, even marks on his body for telling that he would be a great terma revealer. So Ratna Lingpa was so surprised, he, he said, this can't be about me, um, but it was. Um, so he was so happy, and he said, can I copy this? And the old man said, no, you keep that, that's for you. But anyway, um, Ratna Lingpa invited this man to come have dinner, and. Um, because it was already midday by that time. And the yogi stayed outside. He didn't come inside, but Ratna Lengpa gave him, you know, um, sampa, chang, tea, and meat and cheese. Um, and that man gave Ratna Lengpa many instructions about, you know, what was written on the scroll for telling his terma revelations. Um, then it was getting late. Ratna Lengpa said, oh, it's getting late, and you don't have hardly any dress on. Take my chuba, my new chuba, and you can stay here for the night because there's no village anywhere near here. And the old man said, no, I'm, I'm fine. Where I'm going, I, I won't need this anyway. So um, so the yogi, he left. And after a little bit, the yogi told Ratna Lengpa, you, you, you should remember the advice well that I gave you. And remember that and practice that about you know how you engage with those term of revelations. Um, and maintain pure devotion. Always pray to Guru Pamasambhava. Then he gave some indication, like through hints, that he was Guru Pamasambhava through different through different ways, but he didn't come out and say it straight away. Um, then he pulled a small horn from his chuba, blew that in the different directions, and then he just disappeared like that. Ramana Lengpa was so amazed. Uh, he thought, oh, that scroll must have disappeared that he gave me too. So he ran inside, looked, but the scroll was still there. Um, Anyway, then ever since that happened, Ratna Lengpa, he felt so joyful devotion. His mind always kind of stayed in a natural state. And he had this whole radiance and the whole vibration of his, even his house and had completely changed so that when his wife came home, she asked, you look so wonderful. You look so shining, you know. What happened? What happened? And he said, uh, um, he didn't really tell her because he'd been instructed not to reveal that for three years to tell, keep secret their meeting and that scroll. But she kept asking, asking. So over time, he said, here's what happened. Um, and he was so happy. And so they both kept that secret for three years. And then after three years, when Ratna Lengpa, I guess, was 20, about 27, he began to discover termas in many places. So point being that Guru Padmasambhava can appear in many different forms, even as a little old man wearing yellow cotton cloth. First point, which is page 97, the first paragraph. Sometimes when students are learning to visualize, they find it difficult to maintain the visualization. Since the meditation deities are displays of primordial wisdom, their images are not solid objects. For instance, Guru Padmasambhava manifests in many different ways. His form and color are not definite. Sometimes Guru Padmasambhava might transform into a small bird who is singing outside your window. Sometimes he appears, and sometimes he disappears. When his body of primordial wisdom disappears, you should not worry about that you have lost touch with him. Continue your meditation so that Guru Padmasambhava will come back again and again and become more clear. So what I'm, one thing this reminds me of is, uh, 
the Kimball's talking about how even if the visualization isn't clear, that if you really keep that sense of the presence mm -hmm. of Padmasambhava or, or whoever it is that you're visualizing, yeah. you know, and just keep that kind of um, heart connection with the, even mm -hmm. just the essence of what the, the Buddha is, yeah. then um, that's good, you know. And then as he's saying here too, that, you know, to, to keep trying, to yeah. keep trying to visualize, you know, but. There was one time Ani Lorraine and I were were doing Chinese prayers together, and it was it was, like, it, was fun. it was only one thing she she said. It was like we were in the middle of silence. She, she must have noticed I wasn't meditating very hard because she she told me it's like feel the presence of the lineage, you know, feel you know feel that presence, and then you're right back to meditation. Mm -hmm. It was very striking, I think, particularly at the time. It, it's it's amazing how like particularly those those small bits of, of pith advice they they snowball, mm -hmm. you know. It's, you you kind of lose track of, of where the blessings really go to and what they what they make more profound. I have a question though in terms of just even I'm someone who's always had a lot of trouble with visualization and my visualization still is not really very clear. And I mean, I do, I do sort of rely on that presence and then mm -hmm. sort of the essence of, of what the deity is about, you know, mm -hmm. really tuning into that and trying to be that. I, d I just wonder, so what, what is the advice if you're someone who has a lot of uh, trouble having a clear visualization? Mm -hmm. what, what, what are the steps? What does one do? <laughs> uh, well, definitely what you said is, I mean, Rinpoche has always said that's really which of course includes our bodhicitta and our joy and devotion and all those kind of foundations of the practice. I and mean, then maybe even if within the visualization instruction, if you can even just focus on one, one part of it, mm -hmm. like just mm -hmm. on, you know, Guru Pache's smile or just mm -hmm. on Guru Pache's eye. something and then mm -hmm. I think too part of that that part of feeling the closeness is also in a way just like it's like feeling that presence and closeness and I don't know if it's that way for everyone but it definitely seems like it just kind of opens up it's like we relax and sometimes almost by relaxing a little more and that kind of that feel especially that closeness feeling in a way the visualization in a way mm -hmm. and then of course there's also so many wonderful tankas you mm -hmm. know and things like that those she can supports. definitely be used mm -hmm. as a support for mm -hmm. for that and sometimes just by gazing on the tanka and doing the meditation and knowing with these same in, kind of instructions that it's not a fixed substantially existing but that is Guru Padmasambhava and, and the same too with our visualization maybe what are we expecting you know what I mean? <laughs> like, right. What are we expecting to see when we close our eyes and visualize? I mean, we know, but also that part of relax, like keeping that constancy and following the instructions as best we can, seems Rinpoche has always emphasized, and with that closeness feeling, but also not getting too, too relaxed or too, mm -hmm. too caught up on what we're not doing. Mm -hmm. But like that's it seems like. That's good. Yeah, it's really helpful. Yeah. Kind of going off what you were saying too with the tankas. I, I mean, I don't know if I consider this advice as much as anecdotal. Um, I I noticed particularly when I started making soft saws that my my visual my visualization really started to crisp. But actually, not even or sometimes the making of them because I'd have to really like inspect the detail, look uh -huh. for bubbles. But also uh -huh. then when I had to start painting them, you know, because mm -hmm. that I mean, particularly right. if it's a complex one. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, because I mean, some of them, it's you know, you're, you're bringing out the eyes. <laughs> there was a, there was one morning I spent four hours on one chen racing, and you just every detail you're trying to really get it to pop and shine, and it's amazing because then you know you go to meditate later that day and you close your eyes and boom, didn't have to work at it because <laughs> you just spent four hours like burning it into your retina. <laughs> so, yeah. 
you know, those kind of practices too, where you're really, you know, you're, you're in a situation where you really have to inspect, yeah. you know, and things like that, which I'm not sure everyone's going to have the opportunity to make a sasa, though it's wonderful. Um, but, you know, in any, any kind of way to, to really connect to really having, or even, I mean, I guess in that sense, even just inspecting that, that talk, or really noticing all the really intricate detail and, and, and really just really going over it. You know, that, that, that real uh, attention to, the, to those depictions is, is really helpful for mm -hmm. me. Um, I guess it's more um, tip advice that Guru Pramasambhava gave on the, on the visualization stage. In this really amazing book, Deity, Mantra, and Wisdom, it has three fundamental Nyingma texts by Jimmy Lingpa, Kasha Rinpoche, and Getse Maha Pandita. But anyway, in the back of that, there's an appendix, and it has Guru Rinpoche's short, you know, two pages of advice on mm -hmm. visualization. And, and that he says, um, for example, he says, look at the image continuously for a long length of time. Just kind of like what you said. Oh, great. And, then, and then it's a specific instruction yeah. and it must be applied and you have to receive the instruction from the teacher. But then he said, then close your eyes and immediately visualize that image or visualize yourself as that image. Mm. And, and he said, don't keep, if your visualization isn't more clear then, and it becomes dull, then don't meditate like that. Then relax, open your eyes again, and again, look at the image. Over, and he, and he just kind of repeated this, and he said, do this for like three days. I think. He said, do this over and over, continually doing this and interspersing with relaxation, and when you just let go of the visualization altogether, but feeling that, that presence, and it's beautiful. I mean, if we had time, I think part of that too is really just shamatha, you know, like developing some concentration and little bit more mental quietude and then from that basis engaging in the practice and then alternating like that too. I mean it depends on the tip instructions like a Rinpoche's or what you what practice you're doing but mm -hmm. that was his essential yeah, advice for right. meditation. No, that's really true. Part of it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I particularly um, tune into what Maya was saying about just looking at one detail. Because I think that might be part of what it makes it hard for me is I'm trying to do a whole lot of detail at once, you know, without actually. And I've heard that instruction or read that instruction too. So you mean start with the eyes and the eyelashes and the eyebrows and then add the nose. Do you know what I mean? That you kind of really build it up by pieces. And so then, you know, it's not like all of a sudden trying to do something really complex. And it's just like, I mean, to me, even even one figure, do you know what I mean, can, can be complex in terms yeah. of. Uh, because there's that. Tennessee were so materialistic to think, well, it's not really there. Mm -hmm. At least I'm, I'm that way, mm -hmm. I'm very kind of specific type, you know, so it's like, mm -hmm. it's not really there, and so I'm, mm -hmm. you know, it's all vague, and mm -hmm. so, etc. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think how I would apply it to, to the visualization, too. I just remember particularly when, um, it, when, when I was getting trained in, in how to be able to, to hear musical line a few times and be able to kind of regurgitate it. One of the things that my teacher used to tell me, he would he would teach us how to memorize very quickly. And one of the things he used to, to teach was, uh, he called it chunking, where you essentially, you, you take something and you start breaking it down into its component parts, but you start to recognize the pattern of it. So, um, you know, like, you, he would take 10 intervals, you know, we'd have to memorize the 10. He said, think of, think of it in three parts three unit, a three unit, and a four unit. Because it's the same way like a phone number is broken up. You have the, mm -hmm. the blah, 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 dash, blah, 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 dash, blah, 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 mm -hmm. you know, kind of a thing. So I try to think, I mean, so like, I guess for some visualizations, particularly, I think kind of going back to that, you know, you have certain details you focused mm -hmm. on, you know, and then you kind of like, okay, now I can kind of pull those together. Okay, now let me like look over here. Let me, you know, get these together. Okay, now, I, now I've got that, you know, kind of thing too. I don't know. I mean, the, the, I guess the, like, you, like Andrew was saying before, it's, it's, you know, it comes down to what, what are the, the instructions that were given to, to the different particular students. But just more method. Do you think 
drop off. Let's come out. I'm doing this great. I'm <laughs> relaxing. It's so good. I mean, there's one thing that struck me related to this visualization stage practice that Kemba Ramachi had said, and I wrote it down, and like it's really helped me for a lot just to even just to remember kind of the some main points. Um, and it's related to this video that, of Kemba Rinpoche's that's mentioned at the end of this study guide. I um, mean, it was in the Union of Mahamudra and Dzogchen, and Kemba Rinpoche said, and I just have it written down, with Vajra pride and purity, while feeling the presence of all the Buddhas, we will get the full result of the visualization practice, even if the visualization is not perfect. So, again, it's with Vajra pride and purity, while feeling the presence of all the Buddhas, we will get the full result. So then here, I think in its, it lists these three parts that are mentioned in Kemba uh, teaching in that video, and they're, and they're the same things we're talking about now. And the first is this clarity part, where it is detailed as it can be, the visualization, and if it's not that detailed, it'll grow as we keep practicing, but the main point, like Anne said, is to feel the presence of the, there is an actual Buddha there, they're so happy you're like trying to develop these qualities, but to really feel, to, to let yourself be, this is really real, this is happening, you know. And then the second point was the purity, or the Dakpa in Tibetan, and Kemba Rinpoche said that was like seeing the purity of the compassion, the purity of the wisdom, and the purity that's beyond duality. So since some I think in Contra Rinpoche's, the first great Contra Rinpoche, he said the, the emptiness aspect of the visualization, or here, like in the chapter, Contra Rinpoche's are saying that it's, it's not solid, it's not fixed, it's totally transcend, transcendental wisdom rainbow light. So to really feel it's there, but it's not there in any fixed, structured way. It's totally flexible, it's just luminous awareness, more of this emptiness. So we have like the detailed, like something really there, but it's empty. And then the third part is to like stably be with it. So the third part is this stability, or Tongpa, I think Rinpoche said. So it has to do with the shamatha or the concentration, and also this vajrapad component, mm -hmm. like to be with it and to be really convinced with it, to really fully settle into that, like the vajrapad. This is actually the true, the true nature. This isn't pretending or something. So, and then Rinpoche, in one sentence, included those three points, which is beautiful. With Vajra Pride and purity, while feeling the presence of all the Buddhas, we'll get the full result. It's really beautiful. And that's the emptiness part. It has the shamatha part, because we're sustaining it as practice. And then we're really believing it, feeling it, like really being there with it. But that was very profound, those three points. And Because I think, like we've all been saying, that I think a big, the big obstacle that we face is I can't do it well, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I can't visualize well. So we, if we don't have the details, just like you're saying, you know, like and that, there's even without that part, if we really feel the presence, like you said, and just also the two other parts, from which I said, if the if the visualization's not clear, mm -hmm. as long as we really trying to connect with the emptiness, where's this coming from? It's my mind. It's not. You know, this is all mind. And then secondly, the, like to really stay with that, with confidence. Mm -hmm. Then gradually, like the clarity, the detail will fill out, and the practice, the mind will sharpen. Those qualities of mm -hmm. clarity will come more and more strongly or clearly. It's. I thought it's interesting too how in this chapter, of course, there's Rinpoche's have given so many instructions on visualization and things, but this in this particular chapter it seems like the emphasis is really on not, in a way, like not, like he talks about the little bird at your window. Oh, right. That can be Guru Pache. And it's like, that's okay. not what you're trying to visualize, or you know what I mean? <laughs> or like, it's not even so much, a lot of the chapter doesn't even talk about formal practice so much. Just in that sense of how, maybe the way we, you know, the room we're sitting in, and the world that it is just like our body as it is like even if we're not seeing it as like you know how it might be described in the text or seeing Guru Rinpoche as you know it's mm -hmm. described in the text but just that aspect of settling into the practice where 
just knowing and just just like we know our heart is beating or something you know like this is my body you know this is Guru Pache, even if just feeling that 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 part of the presence how it's like everything that's appearing is kind of like this pure land even if it's it's you know we're not going to put any rules and regulations on how it's supposed to look or sound or smell or taste or you know or i mean all those like that that aspect of the practice so and and also like here where Ramatana Lingpa wakes up and there's you know this man who has so much to offer you know what i mean and and he recognizes maybe later oh that was padmasambhava or that ha you know but that but but still he 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 got a lot out of that you know he didn't miss any kind of opportunity because oh it's just some old man you know or something like that but i mean he took full he really engaged like with what he was doing you know so yeah. i know that was just like i just thought that was an interesting part as far as this what's in the book under this title you know that it seems like it's that like we've been talking and i think it's definitely interesting we talk more about like the you know different kinds of samadhi and concentration and the little points we've talked about but i just thought it was really kind of interesting like that level kind of underneath all right. that stuff seems to be what rinpoches are kind of right. trying to give a, a sense of that you know they're not making a, di a disconnect between what's appearing to us and what we're meditating on in a way i mean no. Without, you know, mm -hmm. you know that's great this. because it's like the little bird at the window. You think, oh, I'm distracted. Yeah, you know what I mean. That same, yeah, that everything's included. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, like what you were saying. That's really nice. Yeah. I think it really reminds me of that instruction. Sometimes people will say, such and such thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. How should I? Is this a good sign or a bad sign? And then Rinpoche will have said so many times, if you're in a retreat environment or if you're just really connecting to your practice, you take everything as being a good sign. Everything is an indication to go back to your practice, to keep, keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a little bird. If it, if it becomes a reminder of connecting to your nature and really inspiring this mm -hmm. genuine bodhicitta and this sense of like the fresh, joyful mm -hmm. awareness and... Like then all these relative things, all these changing things, if we can use them, whether they're difficult or not, to help us come practice, to help us yeah. remind us of what the whole, our trajectory, the path, and like the point of the path, then it's beautiful. I think it's, it's so hard to do. I mean, it's just, maybe for other people it's not. For me, it's hard to you know, bring everything onto the path, you know, like that's really... <laughs> Sorry, it, was, it was an instruction I remember reading early on. It was not not here, but before here that you, like um, it might have been Thich Nhat Hanh where he was he was talking, but though he was talking about like introducing it very slowly, like you know when when you hear uh, like a telephone ring, mm -hmm. you just you you habituate yourself to like every time you hear a telephone ring that you take that moment, stop, take three breaths. Or I mean, in the case of telephone, sometimes we only have one or two breaths time. <laughs> but you know, in that same time, you know, it's you, you use you you use that that audio kind of signal to you know stop, breathe. Oh, I'm here. Hi. You know, kind of. It, it, so I, I think you know if you if you slowly add in those things, when you just you you use that as that reminder to even just stop. You know, it's. I, yeah, because I think it'd be really hard to, you know, particularly jump right into it and just, you know, feel it's particularly joyful about, you know, hearing a phone ring. I know I don't feel very joyful about hearing phone rings, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes you could just even, I remember I, I used to make a big point of that, part, particularly because there used to be a lot of phones ringing, you know, was, of stop. Ah, you know, it's, it's much nicer. And then, and then, of course, then you can build it up to, to where, where else you need it to be. And you can even add more things. Hear a toaster pop. You should breathe. A lot more time with the toaster. And it's, yeah, and, and it seems like 
Well, along those lines too, Zonkar Kensei, he says something interesting. He said, you should change those frequently because once your mind gets used to that, it just becomes same old, same old, and you kind of forget what the door opening means. So continually switch it up so that your mind doesn't just routinely, normally go through its normal thing. But, mm -hmm. but I, I find too, like, a, one of the, how the foundation, like, what we were talking about, like, how Rinpoche said at the beginning of every teaching, which we've heard so many times, but just the motivation being in the right place, you know? That's like, right. bodhicitta, and, you know, the two motivations, bod the bodhicitta and the skillful means of the vajrayana, you know, the three vajra states being, like, indispensable tools that really will aid our visualization mm -hmm. practice, mm -hmm. not only at the devotional level, which is the central key of all the practice in Vajrayana, but even at the level of clarity and, and visualization mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. like the, I remember the first, I think it was the first question I ever asked for the chase and the, during a teaching, and <laughs> they were saying, visualize all sentient beings in front of all sentient beings <laughs> in the tree, and I was like, oh, oh no, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> so I, I asked them, I asked them that. Complex. I was like, Rinpoche, you started by saying, visualize all sentient beings, and then they start laughing. You know? <laughs> They're like, they said, of course, it might be difficult at first <laughs> to visualize all sentient beings. But they're like, this is a Mahayana that we're practicing. Maha means great vehicle. That means we include all sentient beings, at least in the mental level, and realize while you're practicing engaging in the visualization, you should really consciously include every single sentient being. So even if you don't visualize all of them immediately, but by including them, you will, your capacity to hold that and will become more and more, and it will come more clear over time. Yeah. But anyway, just to come back to that essential point that whatever technique we're using, if that's our motivation, it will work, you know, it will work. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's what Rinpoche say over and over again, I've heard them say so many mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny you mentioned that too, particularly flipping back over that first topic point, because I remember I was, I was sitting and meditating this morning, and I was trying to Trying real hard to try to expand that, that visualization. <laughs> and finally remembered to include the squirrels outside that kept eating that darn bird seed we kept putting out. They're so tricky. Because they just get in there and throw the stuff. So it's very hard to include them and feel compassion. But I finally remembered this morning because they're right there. They're making a ruckus for sure. So that you know it's it's good to to uh, not feel closed off just because they're eating all the bird seed. <laughs> And I think at all, like everyone's saying, and what Lai, you seem to really be emphasizing is that, I mean, this is also, this visualization practices, is, it's within the Vajrayana view. And in that view, um, at least according to the teachings, we're not like refusing our experience. We're not only trying to consider certain times or certain states or certain experiences as being, that's my practice, or that's going to be okay, or that's an actually a blessing and everything else isn't. Like we're trying to have that, like you said, the second motivation of those three Vajra states mm -hmm. where it's, it's all flexible and it comes down to it, all our experiences, all our thoughts and racing emotions, like it, essentially they're not our enemies. They're not these things we have to punish or get rid of or just blindly obey. Like, we need to learn how to more flexibly engage with them because there's always that arising aspect of awareness or of our experience. Whether it's going to be a nice thing that we like or a difficult thing that we don't, it's always we're always going to be moving. And so I say that not because I can do that, but just it's, it's that contracting against things that's more or less the root cause of this suffering mm -hmm. that we experience. Like, right. something happens, we contract, we suffer. Like, as opposed to something happening, we try to open and be aware and clear and receptive. Doesn't mean we have to gobble it up or praise it or just to be present with it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is such a key Vajrayana point, and I can't, I can't do it, but I know that's the teaching is... Mm -hmm. 
to really be with what's happening. And in terms of visualization, like really, it means incorporating the relative and not, I mean, really incorporating the relative part. Too. No, yeah, too, because it's, I mean, the relative isn't just, I mean, of course, you know, of course there's all, definitely, particularly when we were going through Mahayana, you're distinguishing how, you know, there's a difference, but at the same time, the, that absolute still includes the relative. So if you're throwing out the relative, guess what else you're throwing out? <laughs> you know. And th this whole book, I mean, of course, it just flows together so beautifully. In a way, it also kind of seems like this advice on visualization, it almost seems like it's an extension of the guru yoga practice. Because that kind of maybe goes mm -hmm. over more goes more over the actual instruction and then it's almost uh -huh. and then of course and then there's the whole story but I mean every single chapter of the book all relates <laughs> with, with the next one or the first one do you want to read the second point real quick and then I mean it's really re-emphasizing what we've already talking about but it's good yeah I was going to say this actually this comes uh, directly from the story. Um, so it, if I remember correctly in the story, this comes uh, after they, they've met and, they're, and I think they're, they're walking now. So they began walking and after a few steps, the yogi stopped and said, you must remember all the advice I have given you. You must have constant, pure devotion and continue to pray to Guru Padmasambhava. Always follow the instructions I gave you today. Then he gave a few hints to show that he was Guru Padmasambhava. He did not say, I am Padmasambhava, but he gave some hints. Then he pulled a small horn from his chuba, blew it in the different directions. The moment he did that, he disappeared. When Ratnulingpa saw that the yogi had disappeared, he thought that maybe the yogi was a magician and that the roll of paper he had placed on his shrine would be gone. He ran inside to check and saw that the paper was still there. After his meeting with the yogi, Ratnulingpa's whole demeanor and outlook changed. He was always very happy, and his mind remained in the natural state. Page 100, last paragraph. Page 101, first and second paragraphs. I, th mm -hmm. I thought a big, a big point with this chapter in general, and this paragraph too, is that um, it's about kind of loosening up how convinced we are of our version of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, like that even just, I mean obviously Radha Lingpa of course is a great Tirtan and so he's so flexible um, and has such realization but all of how he's experiencing in the story is like he's so available for it. Mm -hmm. Like he's so mm -hmm. kind, he mm -hmm. really wants to support this person he hasn't met, he doesn't really understand how it could be happening but he like goes with it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just how he's so fluid with the, what's happening. Um, and it, it seems like with visualization too, it's really helping us to try to really become more fluid. Like we're not so mm -hmm. convinced of our limited idea of what it is and all mm -hmm. this visualization and deities or all this makeup, this mythic something that really is not, it's all just make believe and that's kind of, a, you know, there's like that general idea of that mm -hmm. the magic and mystery is like for kids or for ancient times and it's not really the real instruction or something. But I think it's really, Rinpoche's have emphasized so much, and it's just at the center of the Vajrayana that the nature is totally mysterious. Like, the more, the closer we get to it, the closer we are with our experience, the like, more flexible it is. I mean, the more we can't pin it down. And it, I mean, here he just blows the horn and disappears, and it's just, all of it is just mm -hmm. so incredible. And we could easily dismiss it and be comfortable with our what we already believe. Mm -hmm. but, um, I mean, along those exact same notes, like Rebbe Chazer said so many times, like when the time the time for doubt and investigation yeah. and analysis and exploration is when you're not on the cushion practicing, when you're engaged consciously with that study and contemplation, but when it comes to the meditation itself and the visualization, if you drop that completely, don't engage in that aspect of the practice. Just have, like Draco was emphasizing too, that 
about your competence, you know? That for the whole rest of your life, okay, maybe this is just whatever a game. But now we're not playing a game, you know? You're engaging with the display of your own true nature. That's what the whole aspect of the visualization is, you know? Your own mind. You're working with your own mind's flexibility. Through the blessings of the lineage and the devotion, and you're meeting with with all those circumstances. So anyway, that's a really and that I think does take a lot of practice for some people, including myself, you know, to be able to just let it go a little bit. When you're practicing, just like, you know, when that comes up, just not now. You know, I'm not that's not what I'm doing now, you know? Come back. To just otherwise it's just like Rebbe said, you're tearing down your practice. You're tearing down your practice and you're tearing down your your ability to really, you know, have that confidence and so sorry. that's good advice, you know. I was gonna so say good. sorry if this seems a little off topic for you. I, I just I keep rereading these last two lines in that second point and it just something really striking about it. And maybe it's because I'm doing a little bit of a word substitution here. but you, So it says the yogi, but I keep reading Padmasambhava. So after his meeting with Padmasambhava, Ratna, Ratna Lingpa's whole demeanor and outlook changed. He was always very happy, and his mind remained in the natural state. And I, and I guess I keep kind of, particularly, you know, the conversations we have about Padmasambhava and, and you know, that, that flexibility, and, but also how, you know, nature of your mind and, you know, that... that all those different ways that Rinpoche has really talked about, not only the flexibility, but what all the, all the different levels of meaning of Pama Sambhava. It just, you know, so it, it, those two sentences really just kind of seems to spark when you really kind of play with the, the, the flexibility in that word, you know, in that, in that title. And also, you know, I think it, it, it seems to keep tying back to, again, what Anne really started the, the conversation with, talking about that essence and, and feeling that presence. Hmm. Oh, I just thought those two lines are so beautiful. And here, like why I said, Padmasambhava is the root guru of Tibetan Buddhism. They always say that, you know? So it's like, he's a, it's like when you meet the guru, you know? And, and you're open with that flexibility, like Draco was saying, you go with that. You're meeting the natural state that's just taking form as a human or an old man or a woman or a whatever, you know. And so reading it that way, like you were saying, Lindsay, it looks like when you meet the mind of the guru embodied in a, in a form. Right, yeah. You know, and you, and like you said, follow those instructions of that, what I said, mm -hmm. you know. And then he felt so joyful, had so much devotion. All the circumstances come together beautifully. If he would have been like, oh, you're not, you know, who are you? Like, well, this person standing, standing, standing over me. me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. But then he discovered so many of these profound terms, you know, so. Om Swasti,
by this, this merit may all obtain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing, from the stormy waves of earth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara may I free all beings, the precious bodhicitta, and those without it may it be generated, and those who have it may it never diminish, but always continue increasing. 